Daily Bible Time. Good morning. It is Dominic Steele. It's Friday morning. Thanks for joining us. And uh, the last in our series on 1 Thessalonians. Uh, back to Christopher Watkins' Biblical Critical Theory uh, on Monday morning. And um, today, though, we're focusing on three issues, particularly um, the issue of sex. Uh, we're in 1 Thessalonians 4, the first 12 verses. And... Um, uh, Paul in chapter 3 says, I long to visit you to supply what's lacking in your faith. Now, what might it be that's lacking in the Thessalonian Christians' faith? Well, they're in a highly sex-charged city and they've only recently come to Christ. And uh, perhaps what's lacking in their faith is actually knowing what to do, knowing how to live in the area of sexual behavior um, and choosing to live rightly God's way. So he calls on them. This is God's will, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3. This is God's will, your sanctification, that you keep away from sexual immorality. You want to know what the will of God for your life is? This is God's will, that you keep away from sexual immorality. Now, um, all sexual immorality comes under this heading, pornea. Um, I mean, uh, in the strictest sense, pornea is commerce with prostitutes. But in the wider sense, it's the junk drawer of everything to do with extramarital sexual intercourse. Um, everything to do with sexual activity outside the one man, one woman, lifelong monogamous heterosexual relationship of holy matrimony. And so Paul is speaking about it's God's will that you not be engaged in sexual union when you're engaged, when you're going out. There shouldn't be oral sex going on as a, as a boyfriend-girlfriend couple. Um, he's speaking against petting or heavy petting or um, uh, smutty text messages or reading pornography or any of those, any of that revving your sexual engines when you're not engaged with your marital partner um, in the committed relationship of heterosexual marriage. He gives eight reasons. One, he asks and encourages you in the Lord Jesus, verse one. Um, this is a in, encouragement to people in the Lord Jesus. This is how Christians, God's people, are to live. Uh, two, you have received instruction from us on how you should live and please God. So this is a command which will please God. If you want to please God, you live his way. I went to somebody's house one day. They made this really eggy quiche. I am not an eggy quiche person. Um, and I... Uh, I don't like being called Dom, and I don't like eating fish. Um, and if you want to please me, don't call me Dom, and don't make me eggy quiche. If you want to please God, then actually it's God's will that you avoid sexual immorality. Um, third one, it is God's will, your sanctification. What is God's will for the Christians in the inner west? What is God's will for you as a Christian person to avoid sexual immorality? holiness that's god's will i've got no idea if he wants you to be a doctor or a garbage collector but i know he wants you to be holy now everything else is saying go the other way um the line is it's god's will that you avoid sexual immorality that each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor not with passional passional lustful passions like the gentiles who do not know god the gentiles don't know god they engage in lustful passions. Now, we're about to hit World Pride, we're about to hit Mardi Gras in Sydney, and there's going to be lots of images of passionate lust around us. Not just though, this is not just a homosexual thing, this of course is not that. Um, New South Wales Health, they ran a campaign, safe sex, no regrets, enjoy your passions, just wear a condom. That was the, the line, if it's not on, it's not on, that one of you needs to wear a condom. But that ignores the non-physical negative effects of extramarital sex. Things like inability to trust people, low self-esteem, sex becoming meaningless, people not treating each other with respect, extremely painful breakups. I, I read an American study about the association of virginity at age 18 with educational, economic, social and health outcomes in middle adulthood. Uh, as a report a while ago, but Reg Finger, the author, said, we found that men and women who were virgins at age, age, aged 18, when evaluated approximately 20 years later, had about half the risk of divorce, had completed about an additional year of education and had annual incomes nearly 20% higher 
than those who were not virgins at 18. The pagans are running after passionate lust. It's God's will that you be sanctified, not in passionate lust like the pagans. Now, fourth reason. To do so, or to not do so, is to wrong your brother or take advantage of him. Verse 6 of 1 Thessalonians 4. This means one must not transgress against and take advantage of a brother or sister in this manner. Couple, young couple, going out. Um, they feel like they love each other, whispering to each other about commitment, dreaming about potentially being married, and an emotional commitment's developing, and they want physical relationship. And yet here is a line, and this is actually all the other injunctions, all the other reasons given, are vertical reasons. This is a horizontal reason that's given. That for me, as a young man, to be having sex with her when I'm not married to her is to wrong my brother. Well, hang on. I get it could be wronging my sister, the um, woman I'm with, but how is it wronging my brother? Well, it's wronging the guy that she will eventually marry. For it to be sexually engaged with her now is to be stealing from what is his. And for her to be sexually engaged with him is to be wronging the sister that he will eventually marry, for it is to be stealing what is actually hers. Now, that is a very significant argument that is lost in the more modern translations where they say, must not transgress against or take advantage of a brother or sister in this manner. And they, they actually completely lose the meaning of the translation, uh, of, the, uh, of the original by their translation. Next, uh, next reason, the Lord is an avenger of these offences, as we previously told and warned you. There is a here and now judgment of God on sexual sin, but there's also a there and then judgment of God on sexual sin. The here and now judgment on sexual sin is people are confused, used, abused, in messes, lives screwed up. Um, we look at the Australian cricket captain, Michael Clark, and... Um, the mess that he's made of his life by sexual sin and all over the paper and a life not respected. Um, uh, a tragedy, really. Um, the former Australian cricket captain, Michael Clark, um, uh, a messy, messy incident in Noosa. Um, now, there's a here and now judgment on God, from, from God on sexual sin. But there's a there and then judgment as well, that if you keep on sinning against God, you keep on rejecting God, in the end you will not go to heaven. Sixth reason to live God's way? Well, God has not called us to live in purity, but to live in holiness. The call of God, not to a particular career, the call of God is to be holy in actions and words. Next reason, to reject this instruction is to reject God, who gives his spirit. Verse 8, consequently, anyone who rejects this does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. So there you go, seven, eight reasons. It is God's will that you avoid sexual immorality and that you live in a way that honours and pleases him. Heavenly Father, we come to you recognising that we have not got this right. In so many ways we failed you. And we thank you that in 1 John, um, the Lord Jesus is our advocate before the Father who stands in our defence. Um, that he dies that we might be right with you. That he offers himself as the punishment so we can stand forgiven, blameless, acquitted. And we pray for each other here that we'd come to you seeking forgiveness and that we'd live purely, live holy lives, live lives respected by the pagans. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.